Welcome to today's webinar with the Accountable Care Learning Collaborative. My name is Scott Hammer, and I'll be moderating today's call on the post-acute care quandary, finding alignment and integration. We're excited about today's presentation and the opportunity to explore this important topic. We're grateful to have two leading experts joining us on this call, and we look forward to hearing from them. Just a few housekeeping items I want to cover before we get started. To minimize feedback, please mute your line. If you are dialed in, please use your phone's mute feature. If you are using your computer only, click the microphone icon. If you are using both a phone and a computer, it is best to select the telephone option under audio in the GoToWebinar window, then mute your phone. There will be several opportunities for questions, so please submit them using the questions box of the GoToMeeting window. For today's agenda, it will consist of the following agenda items. Uh, first, we'll hear Kate Delisle, Senior Analyst from the ACLC, about the recent proposed physician fee schedule for 2017 coming from CMS, and the recent adoption of the, the OCM, the Oncology Care Model. Next, we'll introduce our featured presenters, Michelle Templin from Managed Healthcare Associates and Sean Matheson from Levitt Partners. And as I mentioned, we should have time for questions at the end of the session, so we'll take questions from the audience to wrap up our discussion. So first, we'll start off with, with Kate with our ACLC update. And Kate, I'll turn the time over to you. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. So um, I will keep this uh, fairly brief so we can leave plenty of time for Sean and Michelle. Um, but to share some recent news in the world of accountable care. So uh, first, earlier this month, uh, CMS released a proposed physician fee schedule for 2017. Um, and it included several changes to promote value-based care more broadly, you know, improve payments for primary care services, new opportunities for telehealth, and um, the proposed expansion of the diabetes prevention program. Um, but today, I'll quickly come uh, cover some of those proposed changes to uh, Medicare's Cornerstone ACO initiative, the Shared Savings Program, so those that are related to um, accountable care specifically. Um, CMS is proposing multiple adjustments related to ACO quality reporting, the biggest being a revision of the, the quality measure set used in the MSSP. Uh, with these changes, they're proposing to add four new measures uh, to replace or retire seven measures, leaving a total of 31 um, measures in the MSSP. So uh, with these changes, CMS is trying to align the MSSP with those measures recommended by uh, the Core Quality Measures Collaborative, the, um, the group organized by CMS and AHIP, uh, and also those proposed for reporting under the MACRA proposed rule. And so, um, you know, with these initiatives, CMS is trying to reduce the, the burden of multiple quality measures that don't align across public and private initiatives. And, and it's cool to see CMS put that work into action here, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how those measures are adopted by commercial payers, because really that will tell you know, how, how well we can be aligned. Uh, another notable change in the physician fee schedule, CMS is proposing updates to the beneficiary assignment methodology to include beneficiaries who voluntarily align uh, by identifying an ACO professional as being responsible for their care. And uh, this is neat in that it would be uh, available for tracks one, two, and three. So it's a big win for ACOs, it's something that they've been advocating for for a while. We're excited to see this happen. Um, the morning after the physician fee schedule release, we circulated a brief with ACLC members, summarizes the major provisions, um, and that's available on the ACLC member portal if you'd like to go back and review that document. Okay, so the second update I'll talk about today, second ACO update, um, the partic participants in the oncology care model, uh, it's a five-year multi-payer initiative out of CMMI. They were recently announced, and the announcement came uh, just before the model began on July 1st, so just earlier this month. Um, the nearly 200 provider uh, participants is twice what CMS expected in participation when the model was announced. They were initially thinking around 100 practices would participate. Um, and of those 17 uh, private payers, I mentioned it's a multi-payer model. Of those 17 private payers, uh, three are participating in both CPC and the OCM, and those are Cigna, Aetna, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma. Um, and, and we'll look forward to seeing the CPC plus payer participants, you know, also a, a multi-payer model uh, later to, uh, to see which payers are also, you know, adopting CPC plus. As CMS announces more multi-payer models, it's neat to see which payers are, are really um, 
getting involved. Um, and, and I should maybe note, the reason why our team is following the oncology care model so closely and uh, reporting on it here in this ACO update is that although it's an episodic payment model, during those six-month episodes, it behaves like a population-based payment model, behaves like an ACO, um, including all parts A and B services and, and some part D um, in the BOCM calculation. So this ACO bundle hybrid is something that we're excited to be tracking and will um, follow closely um, both just in the policy and the development of the program, but also in our ACO database to see, you know, the, the um, overlap of uh, ACO, OCM, and, you know, all of the, the acronyms, all the participation that's happening nationwide. Um, and with, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Scott, for our, our presenters. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, very helpful information to know and to, to understand a little bit better. And uh, through ACLC, we'll continue to to track and follow these updates and, and, and things that, that, that come out and, and we'll continue to, to inform membership about these updates. So thanks so much. Um, just to set the stage for, for this webinar, I, without further ado, I wanted to get into introductions about, um, about uh, our session participants. Um, uh, the post-acute care quandary, how to find alignment and integration. As value-based care models increasingly involve the post-acute care setting, Acute care providers will increasingly share in clinical and financial risk to, carry, to, to care delivery outside of their walls. There will be more incentive for acute and post-acute care providers to jointly manage patient care across the care continuum. Um, to discuss this, we have two great experts, uh, Michelle Templin and Sean Matheson, to talk about uh, the post-acute care quandary. And um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle. Michelle is Vice President of Strategic Business Development for MHA. Since 2013, Michelle has led the strategy and management of the MHA ACO network, which represents the nation's largest network of post-acute care providers, including long-term care, home infusion, specialty pharmacies, DME, respiratory providers, and skilled nursing, uh, assisted living, and rehabilitation facilities. The MHA ACO network assists in defining local payer PAC engagement strategies, provides critical resources for acute and post-acute care provider connectivity, and analyzes the value of appropriate PAC utilization across the care continuum. So Michelle, welcome. We're, we're grateful to have you on. Also, I wanted to introduce Sean Matheson quickly. Uh, Sean is a manager at Levitt Partners, and he offers applied experience since 1998 in post-acute care and primary care medical group management. Prior to joining Levitt Partners, Sean developed Utah's largest medical group for home and long-term care facility doctor visits. He was instrumental in creating a packed network of collaborations and contracts between hospitals, managed plans, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, and hospice. Sean is a licensed nursing home administrator, having practice in California and Utah. So at this time, uh, welcome, Sean. I'll turn the time over to you and, and have you take us through the, the presentation. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Scott, and it's a real honor for me to be presenting with Michelle. Uh, we'll go to the, to the next slide. So I'll be covering this first section, why it's important to engage with PAC providers, and then Michelle will be covering the second section, why provide, uh, what providers can do uh, to engage PAC. So we are, um, ACOs, excuse me, um, ACOs have been around the longest. We're very used to seeing these types of dissemination charts. Uh, they were the first delivery reform initiative in the last five years, as, as Kate called them, the cornerstone. But we know that value-based care models encompass more than just ACOs. Um, I've listed on the right a few of the most impactful value models. And uh, many of these initiatives have been implemented or on deck. And, and it's really because of these initiatives that post-acute care is really becoming more of a focus for opportunities with value-based providers. So we'll go to the next slide. This is a, a nice illustration of the, the changing landscape uh, just for hospitals. Let's dive a bit there into the, the nature of hospital risk. Um, a risk profile for a hospital participating in value-based care uh, has, has really changed given the advent of 
the HRRP and also now with many bundles. Uh, there's a lot more focus on the post-discharge care. Uh, we used to see that hospital discharge planning was really viewed from a four-wall perspective. But with the hospital readmissions reduction program, that really extended that view, that purview, if you will, to 30 days. Uh, so hospitals, as you know, are, are not paid for the same DRG for certain conditions if that patient represents. But additionally, many hospitals now participate in bundled payments, and this extends that risk for a hospital even further out to 90 days post-discharge. So uh, hospitals really now have a financial and quality risk outside of, of their own setting. This is a, another way of looking at that risk. Uh, this slide gives a little more detail on what that risk looks like. And it really depends on the models that the hospitals participate in. So uh, hospital readmissions reduction program, hospital acquired infections, hospital-based value purchasing combined have about a 6 to 8% downside risk. And you can see the years in which those took uh, initial effect and then full effect those DRG revenues affected from the inpatient uh, prospective payment system. So quite a lot of, of, of risk there for a hospital. Now we see uh, the advent of CGR, which went live April 1st, and that is a, a significant risk to Medicare lower extremity joint replacement revenue, plus or minus 20% uh, to, to that target calculation, and, and that's in 67 MSAs. CPC Plus is, is an exciting space. Um, as Kate mentioned, it's a forthcoming announcement. On July 31st, we'll know which 20 regions the um, CMS has, has uh, selected. But just a, a really significant number there, 5,000 practices will be selected. And right now, currently in the CPC model, it's 500. So imagine the, the impact that that will have, uh, really a fundamental shift in the way primary care is being reimbursed. Uh, we're well familiar, most of us, with MACRA, very significant plus or minus 9% to professional fees, and, and that's taking place nationwide. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if CMS pushes that back uh, with the announcement last week of, uh, with with, from CMS. And then Kate touched briefly in the oncology care management. Um, not as big of a bundle. It's, it's a plus or minus 4% and there's no downside for the first two years. But nonetheless, uh, very significant for oncology practices. This is a, uh, a slide that gives us a, a deeper dive into four value-based models that affect post-acute care. Uh, while not mandatory, models two and three affect post-acute care providers the most. The only mandatory bundle that we have so far is the comprehensive joint replacement, CGR. Uh, in model two, the episode initiates with the hospital, but it includes post-acute care. And then and you see the model three indicators here. Those are initiating within the pack. So model three, to me, is, is really a signal that this is... Um, well, that it's not just the hospitals looking at value-based care, that the PAC providers are the ones that have initiated Model 3 and are very interested in engaging in, in these type of value-based payments. So with BPCI, it's, it's key to note that participation is voluntary, and uh, it'll just be interesting to see how many more bundles CMS moves toward mandatory as it did with CGR. Um, so CGR, as we mentioned, is CMS's first uh, mandatory bundled payment, and, and it really is a signal that other sectors of the care continuum are needed for successful coordination of value-based care. Uh, it, CGR is a significant both for hospitals and PAC providers. Uh, for hospitals, lower extremity joint replacements are the largest volume procedure that take place in an operating room. And for a PAC provider, nursing homes have the largest cost variation for the post-episode uh, care costs for that lower extremity joint replacement. It varies between sixteen dollars to $31,000 just by episode. Um, so because of that significant cost associated with those lower extremity joint replacements and because of those high cost SNF variation, we feel like there's a clear and compelling reason that CMS has made 
CGR, a mandatory bundle, and it really is uh, is creating this process where hospitals and PACs are more aligning and and working closer together. We see here a, a map that shows the 67 MSAs that were selected for CGR, and it will be interesting to see at the end of that bundle uh, how many more MSAs uh, could be folded in. And then a last slide here on CGR is just again to illustrate the significant revenue impact plus minus 20%. I think if we could turn back time and 10 years ago say, could you imagine a payment system that would affect your uh, lower extremity joint replacements by plus or minus 20% to target calculation? Uh, one would be maybe surprised. Uh, so this is a very significant program. And we'll end there with CJR and transition quickly here into oncology care management. So Kate covered um, a bit of this, and, and we certainly have more intel that we could provide. Um, oncology care management, or excuse me, model, I keep calling it management because it really has so much to do with care management, um, but it is really unique in that it provides the oncology practice with upfront funding, and that's one uh, criticism, if you will, that has come prior um, with some of these uh, bundled payment initiatives, and so OCM really involves that up front and provides the practice with some nice funding. So like CGR, chemotherapy, it's a significant Medicare expense. It's um, interesting that Medicare is taking a bundled payment approach to chemotherapy, as cancer care is not something that really has a clear beginning or end point, like say a, a, a lower extremity joint replacement. So for me, this really signals that CMS is increasingly using bundled payments as a cost and quality control mechanism, regardless of the episode, even for a, an episode as um, oncology, something more chronic. Uh, we've done some research around this, and we, we feel like nursing homes and home health won't be affected significantly by OCM, but we do feel like there will be uh, earlier use of hospice, that that will become more of a focus and hospice agencies will have an opportunity to really showcase their value. Hey, Sean, I wanted to ask a question really quick. We had one that came through that, that said, is there any additional insight you might have um, on what might be the next mandatory bundle CMMI announces and timing? I know that's, that's kind of difficult to know, what, you know, the mindset of, of what CMMI is thinking. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts that you have around that? Um, you know, we have CJR uh, right now. Um, certainly, those bundles coming, those episodes coming out of uh, BPCI would be the logical, whichever ones are, are probably having the most um, either success or um, have the most participation, mm -hmm. whatever episodes those are. I've heard cardiovascular might be one. Um, any insight that you might have around, around that? So our, our Washington office would be the best to answer that question. Sure. They're, they're very close to those matters. Uh, like you, I've heard that cardiovascular could be a next uh, clear-cut episode. Uh, nothing official, though. Um, perhaps my colleague, Michelle, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'm with you on the cardiovascular. I, my guess, if I had to uh, go to bed and put money on it, would be COPD mm -hmm. and CHF just because it's also in line with the hospital readmission program and it is from a utilization standpoint probably the next in line under the joint replacement. But again, total speculation. I have no idea what CMS may be thinking, but that would be my guess. Great insight, Michelle. Thank you. That's great insight. And I think what we can say for sure is that bundled payments are definitely a mechanism that CMS seems to be turning to right now. And I think we can expect that we'll we'll see increased focus in this payment mechanism. So far we've touched into CGR and OCM. I'd like to just briefly touch into uh, Comprehensive Primary Care Plus, CPC Plus. I have a, an eight-year background in primary care uh, prior to my nine-year background in long-term care, and I'm just uh, very excited to see Medicare shift payments. We, we know that fee-for-service doesn't really work too well for population health. So to see CMS making this change to a value-based payment is very exciting. So CPC Plus is a, it's a big undertaking. It shifts the way 
primary care practices are paid. Just in the sheer numbers of primary care practices is significant. We mentioned that this grows from CPC is the current bundle. It turns to CPC plus, and it grows from seven regions to 20, almost triple, from 500 practices to 5,000, almost tenfold. Uh, and it may not be intuitive that primary care affects post-acute care, but in the value-based models, the entire care continuum must coordinate. And Michelle is going to touch more into that. Um, but examples of this include primary care physician groups embedding doctors, nurse practitioners into nursing home, such as the uh, practice that I uh, led for the last few years. Um, we also see that opportunities for primary care physician groups and home health agencies lie in more closely partnering with each other as the primary care group is more focused on population health. So I think we'll see the, the wrapping in in time of home health agencies and, and, and nursing facilities. Well, let's talk briefly about the IMPACT Act. This is a, a really transformative act to the way hospitals and long-term care facilities interact with each other. We've talked about the importance of hospitals working with PAC providers and primary care physicians through CPC Plus working with PAC providers. The IMPACT Act enables this kind of collaboration across the care continuum. It really requires the standardization of patient assessment elements across provider care settings. And we see those uh, standardized elements that CMS is putting forth in those MLN uh, calls. So as CMS standardizes and aggregates data across multiple settings, it really facilitates the possibility for increased shift to value-based payments for PAC providers. I, I believe it's going to start with the standardized data for these different metrics, and then it will really pave the way for future opportunities for different types of payment mechanisms. And lastly, um, I'd, I'd like to conclude with this idea that the value-based landscape is going to continue to evolve over time, and that as it does, developing these high-value networks outside of the hospital is really becoming more important for successful care coordination. Post-acute care can be a significant game-changer for hospitals and for physician groups uh, who are looking to improve their patient outcomes and to decrease their costs. Uh, so my colleague Michelle uh, is going to explore ways that uh, we can best engage with PAC providers. Great, and hopefully everybody can hear me okay. And wanted to say thank you to Sean and, and thank you to Scott and, quite frankly, everybody at the ACLC. Um, we at MHA are greatly honored for the opportunity to present today regarding this topic that we consider to be of significant um, importance. But for everybody else on the line, I wanted to just do a, a quick step back for you all. Um, I realize not everyone may be familiar with MHA and why we care so much about post-acute care. Um, we are a healthcare services and technology company based in Florham Park, New Jersey, um, and we service only the post-acute care industry, hence the reason we are so passionate about it. Um, we offer about six or seven different programs, but as you can see from the slide here, um, pretty much every aspect of the post-acute spectrum um, become customers or members of MHA in one facet or another through the different programs that we offer. Um, and that includes everything from specialty home infusion and long-term care pharmacy to the facilities themselves, the nursing homes, assisted living facilities, CCRCs, home health agencies, hospices, and the DME and HME and respiratory and orthotic providers that work alongside that. So we have members in all 50 states, plus Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico. And, you know, with over 25 years of experience, it's, it's, a, it's something that we continue to and have always been, but significantly continue to be very passionate about post-acute. And that's one of the reasons um, why we, and if you can get to the next slide, um, about a year ago, we got together with um, a lot of the great minds at LP and kind of thought it would be really interesting to do some studies around post-acute with ACOs. Can you advance to the next slide, please? Great. So we started talking about, it would be really good to look at how do ACOs look at post-acute care providers and what are they doing in terms of engaging them as part of their greater strategy? And also, how do post-acute care providers look at these new models that are coming down the path or are in, are in various degrees of being implemented? And how do they want to be part of the continuum? 
And so we actually um, commissioned LP to do some research. And alongside with them, we um, conducted 16 interviews, uh, 10 of them with ACOs in various different taxonomies, so different types of ACOs, everything from hospital-based to full spectrum to physician group-based in all geographies across the United States. And then we also had them talk to some of our post-acute care providers, some of our members. And then we spoke with one commercial payer, too. And really from this, we pulled a bunch of information that I'm going to be sharing with you guys today about what's going on in the world, where do we see the opportunity, and quite frankly, where are some of the barriers and what we need to do to overcome those barriers. And then on the right-hand side, I, I also want to talk a little bit about the post-acute care provider's role. Um, this graphic that you see here is from a white paper that we did with, uh, that we published with other partners about a year and a half ago. And on the outside, uh, the light blue there, you can see it's, it's your traditional post-acute care providers as defined by CMS and Medicare and pretty much the, the overall industry. It includes the LTACs, the SNFs, the home health agencies, the hospices, the ERP. Um, but when we really started looking at this and, and digging into it, we said, yes, of course they're important and they're post-acute, but there's this whole layer underneath, which is in the gray, which is the support service providers, that when an ACO or anybody who is looking at really increasing value can't disregard them. They, are, they play a pivotal role, whether it be pharmacy or your oxygen provider or whomever it may be, they play an important role on the care of that patient and should also be taken into consideration when looking at a post-acute strategy. So I think this graphic does a nice little way of, of summarizing that and wraps it all around the patient, which is really where it's centered. Next slide, please. Engaging post-acute. This was one of the very first questions that we asked. And what are really those driving factors that are that are um, that are the ACOs are saying that are really that making them to either start engaging um, or want to start engaging with them? And after all of our um, data analytics and research, we kind of found it was really focused around four different areas: financial, clinical, market, and value. Um, the financial aspect of it was this this sense around an, an increase in risk that they anticipated additional risk being put on them and potentially additional risk being put on the post-acute care providers. Um, from a clinical perspective, they have, they have one of the driving factors is this need for this reduction in readmissions and the improvement in overall outcomes. And from a market perspective, this was really interesting, particularly for the ACEs that we spoke to that were in very, very competitive markets. They felt the need to go out there and really engage the post-acute care providers to really enhance and create this great network that really was across the full continuum and to be able to be the first to market in their area with that, to beat their competition, if you will. And then last but definitely not least is value. It's this word that you're going to hear, you've already heard a lot, but that you're going to continue to hear. You know, the ACO said, hey, we want to have this post-acute strategy. We want to be a leader. We want to show that we have shared accountability with our providers that are participating. We really want to show that we're, we're mined and we're centered around this full continuum of care, not just maybe our one specific area, if it's a physician group or if it's a hospital group, that they're really more care continuum-minded. Next slide, please. So then we kind of started talking with them about, well, what, do you, what would you really want from that partnership? If you could have an ideal partnership, what would it be? And we focused this on what the ACO would want, and we also then turned around and asked what the post-acute care provider would want. And then we kind of stuck them against one another and looked where are they similar and where are they still very far apart. And here we took the four basic areas that you saw from the previous slide, and we added two more dimensions and domains to that around data and coordination, and I'll go through this because some of this information is, is really interesting. So on the financial, as we mentioned earlier, obviously people know it's, it's really to, to reduce costs, and, and from an ACO perspective, when you're talking about post-acute care, that evolves mainly around at decreasing the average length of stay and decreasing the overall cost of the total episode for care of that patient. Um, however, ACOs were also spoke to, who spoke to us were also interested in potentially sharing risk and aligning some more of the financial incentives with their post-acute care providers um, to get them on board and to get them to work more with them. From a post-acute care provider perspective, they were kind of more around, hey, we just want to make sure that we continue to receive these referrals, whether it be from the hospital or 
whomever it may be that's providing to them from the primary care physician, they wanted to make sure that they had what needed to be or they had in place what needed to be in place to get that referral. And then they also, a few of them did mention this concept of gain sharing. They had known enough about some of these models to know that there was, this was out there, but they hadn't really seen, nor had we seen a lot of it in practice in the marketplace. But they were interested in it to learn more about it to say, hey, that might be an opportunity for us to be able to have some skin in the game. Um, on the clinical side here, we did see a lot of similarities here. Um, the ACOs really wanted, you know, task providers that could manage complex patients and that could show that they could design and implement disease-specific programs. Um, particularly a lot of this was around things like lower extremity joint replacement, COPD, CHF, some of these that, that are fairly common in post-acute. And the post-acute care providers wanted to really be able to find ways to show to the ACOs that they could manage difficult patient mixes, that they had disease-specific programs, and that they were able to implement them, and that um, they were able to participate in determining care protocols. Um, that was something that was really important to them. So we did see a lot of, of similarity on that end. Um, from a quality perspective, again, you know, everybody wants to, I think that's kind of completely understood, whether that be four or five star ratings is what the ACOs wanted. Um, they wanted to have shared quality metrics, whether that be ones that were from CMS or whether that be ones that they determined themselves. And they wanted the patient to have a really good overall experience, whether the food in the facility was great and they had Starbucks co coffee, all of these kind of things weighed at really in on that. Um, the post-acute care providers, obviously, they also want and to, be, to show that they were a four or five star rated facility. Um, and they wanted to also be able to say, hey, we've got some great quality metrics that we want to be able to share with you too. Um, from a market perspective, ACOs, a lot of them had done some analysis and said, ooh, we've really got a lot of providers that we're referring to. We need to find a way to kind of reduce the size or narrow it. Um, and not just randomly do it, but really narrow it to what they were calling their high-value network providers. And high-value, I understand, is, is something that is defined differently across the board, but that was really something that they wanted. And from the post-acute care provider perspective, um, they wanted to really be part of the network, and they wanted to be one of those high-value or deemed one of those high-value network providers. But in addition to that, they wanted to really be an asset active contributor in the network. They felt that they had a lot to offer. They felt that they could contribute a lot professionally around the care that they deliver and that they've been delivering for many years, and that they could really be a great contributor to help that ACO meet whatever their overall goals were. So that was something that they really wanted out of that partnership. Um, from a data perspective, the ACOs wanted um, providers that could aggregate their data and perform analytics on it and report it out to them. Um, which is a challenge, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and the post-acute care providers, what they really wanted was an ACO who'd be willing to share some of their resources with them in terms of whether that be an IT system or whether that just be access to data records or better electronic communication. They really wanted to have a partnership that could share some of that resource. And then last but not least, on the coordination aspect, ACOs were really looking at providers that had embedded resources, that had transition coordinators, care coordinators, um, everybody in the facilities or in the home health agencies themselves. Also ones that were having community programs, so transferring out of post-acute into community that they had programs set up for that coordination and that important step. Um, and the PAC providers really wanted from the ACOs, they wanted to see the embedded hospitalists and surgeons in their facilities too so that they could have some more dialogue and engagement directly with representatives from the ACOs. So uh, this is a nice, it's, a, it's very much a summary of a lot of work, but I think it gives you guys some good ideas of what we found out. Um, with that all being said, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that this doesn't, because of that, it, does, it, it doesn't mean everything's easy. There are still a significant amount of barriers that are out there which are preventing a lot of this post-acute care partnerships in some of these value-based arrangements. Um, I think uh, about uh, 20 to 25 percent of all ACOs right now have a fully implemented and functioning post-acute care strategy. Um, so that's still a very, very small percentage of those that have that. And some of the reasons for that, and these are many of them, but I'll hit on these two because I think that they are the biggest by far, is first and foremost the incentives for the value are not always aligned. 
Um, not only is it things around different quality metrics, but just purely, especially in post-acute right now, there's misalignment of financial incentives, kind of like what hospitals went through earlier, you know. Right now, the way nursing homes are paid is to have a head in that bed, but yet if you're trying to get pressure from your ACO to decrease your average length of stay, it is a little bit of a misalignment for the, for the PACS providers that's confusing for them, and they're trying to work through that. Um, as of right now, there's no wider value-based reimbursement system. Um, that's a challenge, too, in, in terms of that. And there is and does sometimes seem to be a disconnect on treatment and administrative protocols. We've seen this and we've heard this particularly from some of our nursing home providers around, you know, protocols of treating patients in nursing homes, how they may differ from that of treating a patient in a solo practice or treating a patient in an acute care facility and how there's, there's sometimes a lot of disconnect around that and in misalignment, if you will. Um, and there's also a significant amount of the need for this increased sophistication amongst the post-acute care providers. This is something that our membership we see will readily admit themselves. Um, the biggest area here is around data and health IT. And this is not something I know that is unique to post-acute. It's happening in pretty much everywhere in healthcare right now. But there is a, a very big um, a very big uh, chasm, if you will, around what can be pulled and how the data can be pulled. Now, the impact act that Sean had mentioned earlier will help to try and standardize some of that. We're not quite there, and it's going to be a few more years before it gets fully implemented, but that is something that has recently been done and is looking to address that because it is a massive issue. But when you have various different assessment systems and tools, and then you have literally hundreds of different operating systems and EHRs and all of that that come into play on that, it becomes pulling and aggregating the data very, very difficult, very cumbersome, um, and also um, it's just not a sophisticated way of going about it. Um, also, there needs to be an increased sophistication in, in our post-acute providers do, met, do say this and admit it on the education of the programs themselves. Um, they don't know everything about all the different programs. Again, I don't think this is something that's unique. I know that a lot of other parts of healthcare need to also be educated on all of these programs. But for them, particularly as owners and operators of businesses that very well will be operating in multiple programs, you'll have patients that are there as part of a bundle, patients that are there as traditional fee-for-service, patients that are in your facility as an ACO patient. They really need to understand it, and they need to understand how can they manage to the goals of each one of those various different programs, but then yet also provide the level of care that they need to provide to their patients. So it's something that they have to get more educated on. And then again, of course, I think just care management. And some of the things from care management, I believe, could be eased within, with a greater sophistication of data and health IT tools. Um, you could get some better data and information sent around care transition, care management, actually being more automated, electronic. So I think some of those things go hand in hand. But these are by far the biggest barriers that we found from our research as to why things are not being implemented at a faster speed, what the challenges are, and why such a small percentage of ACOs today have, a, have fully implemented a PAC strategy. Next slide, please. I wanted to share this, and, and I uh, thanks to the, the guys at LP for pulling this together, because these are actual quotes from some of our I interviews that we had. And I'm going to go through them because I think they tell a lot about what's going on and why we see some of the barriers and challenges that still exist today. Um, the first comes from an ACO that is a hospital-based ACO. And here they say it's a growing need for more solidified ACO PAC partnerships that include a financial component. We talked about earlier, most a lot of times those financial um, those financials are not always aligned, but yet they're recognizing this needs to be that way. Um, the second one down is also from a hospital ACO. You know, PAC is incredibly important to us. It's where most opportunities lie. They're looking at it from an ACO and an entity that has to hit certain uh, certain savings rates and certain savings numbers, and they're realizing that opportunity to hit those numbers is not within their own four walls. It really is within the post-acute care. Quite interesting, again, it's coming from a hospital-based ACO. And then the third quote, which is probably my personal favorite, um, the PAC has been the wild, wild west for too long. The shift to value is a good thing. Um, as someone who's worked in the post-acute industry for 15-plus years now, 
often we felt like it was the wild, wild west. You know, post acute was always kind of seen as its own little thing operating outside of the guise of the hospitals and the primary care physicians, and now it's being forced to come back into the mold. And it is kind of like a little bit of, of the wild, wild west and bringing it back in. And then last but not least, I want SNFs to come with me with what I want. It's too tiring for me to constantly be going to them, and I want the data sophistication. And I think that is a good, a good sense of the frustration that we see out there around the inability to pull the data, the inability to put it in a, a system or a way that's functioning. And, and real quick on that, it's, on that, it's not as if the post-acute providers don't want to do it or don't want to show that they have the ability to do it. It's often seriously a system implementation where they can't get the information pulled from the system in the format that you want. It's not always that, that simple, and that's why we know that obviously the impact act will address some of it, and then you've got private industry that's also working on other aspects of it. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for the future? Um, well, change is on the doorstep. I think that that is, is, <laughs> is definitely uh, the truth. And, we at MHA kind of look at post-acute and the providers that we represent as one of three, and you can see it here, and we call it the tripod. Um, it's one of three parts that now all have to work together. There is a growing interdependence. If anybody or any of these programs are going to be successful, it can no longer be this program is being driven by the hospital or this program is being dri driven by a physician group or this program is being driven by tax providers. They all have to realize that they have a role together. Yes, one may be more at certain points in time, maybe uh, you know something to lean on more than the others, but we really look at it as that, that tripod in that they all have to be there, they all have to have strong legs, or it's going to come falling down. And with that, we do truly believe that that is a huge opportunity for the post-acute industry to get out there, to get in more involved with the hospitals, with the physician groups, and with everybody else in the healthcare continuum and really be able to show um, what opportunities are there for them to be able to coordinate and put themselves as part of that continuum. Next slide. Last slide. Well, with that, so Scott, I will hand it back to you. Um, I think we've got about 15 minutes left. So if there are any questions that have come in, more than happy to address them. Michelle, thank you so much, and Sean, thank you as also for uh, presenting your insights and, and sharing your thoughts and perspectives on the post-acute care environment and how this is all evolving towards accountable care and, and how the post-acute care space uh, fits into that, that puzzle. And, um, certainly interesting times uh, for post-acute care and for acute care coming together. Um, at this time, we'd like to jump into the Q&A portion of our session. If you have a question, uh, please submit it using the questions box of the of the GoToWebinar window, and we can certainly address those questions when they come in. Um, to begin, maybe I wanted to direct a question to Sean. Um, currently, how well do post-acute care entities interact with hospitals? Um, so, historically, I, I, I'd imagine it hasn't been great interaction, um, certainly with these new programs coming out from CMS. Um, Maybe it's getting better. Uh, certainly, BPCI knows that you know with Model Two, right? That's that's an episode that goes across hospital and post-acute care. So there are opportunities for that collaboration. But um, how has the interaction been in the past mm -hmm. for post-acute and, and hospitals? So I, I think the interactions in the past are um, really multivariable. But uh, as you just mentioned in your question, and as Michelle has talked about, things are very they're changing very quickly. Um, some of the variables that play into that transition, I, I think, include one is the sophistication of the PAC provider, also of the hospital. Are they part of a big chain, or is this more, say, a mom and pop uh, type organization? A second thought that comes to mind is the size of, of the hospital or the PAC provider. That, that's going to play a factor. A third is the, the taxonomy of the of the hospital and, and the PAC itself. In other words, are, is this a ACL hospital? Uh, is it a hospital that has, it, is it a CGR hospital? Is it a hospital that has a number of other bundled pay initiatives that it's involved with? And then just a last thought on that. One thing we've noticed through our research as well is if it's a underbedded market for nursing homes versus an overbedded market, that really plays a factor in 
how much the PAC providers want to engage. You know, if your census is constantly 98% and, and your average Medicare daily census is, say, 35 or 40, there probably is less impetus for you or less motivation for you to really engage in a different type of payment model if things are running pretty smoothly. However, we see markets where there's an overbedded situation. Uh, here in Utah, for example, we have a 78% average daily census in our nursing homes, whereas in California, we were more about 91%. So two very different markets in terms of approaches that the PAC providers have for engaging. But I'll, I'll just leave on this thought that things are shifting quickly, and I think that the advanced PAC providers understand that this is a shift to value. It's coming to PAC. It's already here with the hospital reduction, readmission reduction program, CJR. These things are quickly changing the landscape. Terrific. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we had a question that came in that, that says this, and maybe I'll direct this to you, Michelle. First, uh, it says, what types of financial incentives would PAC providers be most interested in? Uh, and then uh, the second question is, what is permissible uh, under the MSSP ACO regulations? Michelle, do you have any thoughts about that question? Uh, I'll address the first part. Um, I think, Please. again, hello? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh -huh, we can uh, hear you. The first part of it, I think anything that has to do with, obviously, the quality of care that they have to provide. Um, I know a lot of our providers, particularly on the nursing home side, have already created disease-specific programs against the, the, um, the majority that, that will, were aiming to show that because of the care that they provide, that, they have in, that they've increased the outcome. The outcomes are better, and better can be loosely defined, whether that be a shorter average length of stay, whether that be a better patient experience, however they define better, and it's different with each one of them. Um, I think anything like that that allows them to show that they can practice at their highest level possible is something that they would very much be interested in because, you know, these people are very, you know, they've been doing this, most of them have been doing this for a long time. They are you know, very highly educated, well-trained professionals, and they want to be able to show that they can do what they that they always thought out to do. So anything around that, any type of a program or a financial incentive that could be designed around that, um, I think it's something that they would be interested in. I can't guarantee all of them would want to 100% jump in it with, you know, <laughs> no hold far, but um, that is, that's what we've heard, at least from them. Um, I haven't heard too much directly from the ACOs on what they would like to do, but from a provider perspective, that's what's most of interest to them. They want to be able to showcase themselves and what they can do and what they can do well. Um, in terms of what's allowable under the program, you know, I think this is probably not really address, at least as much as I know. I am not a policy person, so I, it just began me kind of just talking about my own experience here. Um, but I don't think it's actually specifically addressed, and therefore it is kind of gray, and therefore it's not well defined. Um, but I'll defer that to anybody else. I don't know, Sean, if you know any of uh, that is specifically addressed, but I think that's one of the other issues and challenges is that it's not specifically addressed. So people are kind of saying, hmm, we don't want to get ourselves in trouble by doing something, um, and they're not quite sure how to pull it together yet. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Michelle. Um, on that gray area, there seems to be some more development that CMS and the um, Office of Inspector General have issued. So we saw a, a statement in November that came out, and it was a, a final rule that formalized waivers of specific fraud and abuse laws in relation to the shared savings program. And so this joint statement uh, uh, really related to certain provisions of the physician referral law, the federal anti-kickback statute, civil money penalty laws, et cetera. So what we're seeing is that um, ACO governing bodies must meet certain requirements in order to be eligible for these fraud and abuse waivers. But there seems to be a message that, uh, of necessity, a, a value network has to be able to refer to each other. And I, I think that we'll see more clarification on this forthcoming, certainly this statement from the OIG in November. And if anybody's interested in that, um, you know, please ping me and I'll, I'll, I'll provide you the link to that statement. I think we'll see more clarification coming uh, in that gray area. Great. Thanks uh, both Sean and Michelle for those answers. Very, very helpful insight. Um, maybe a question for Michelle. Uh, generally speaking, 
how well uh, do PAC providers understand clinical outcomes and transitions of care? And is there a will and, and an incentive to become better at, at these disciplines? Uh, certainly, Sean spoke a little bit about the Impact Act, and so there's sort of movement going across the, you know, make, making quality better. Um, Michelle, would you like to address that question? Sure. How, in terms of how well do they understand clinical outcomes? I mean, again, it's it's <laughs> that is somewhat an individual's um, answer, but I would say generally, uh, for what we hear and what we know about our our membership, is they understand it very well. Um, whether it's the DON or the medical director or you know the the director of pharmacy, they understand what the clinical outcomes need to be. They're up to date on them. Understand it. Um, again, outcomes is, is loosely defined depending upon how you want to talk about it and whether it's a specific program. Um, but I think they understand it and I think that they are willing to, if they don't, become more educated on it based upon what a specific um, need might be from an ACO. So if their need really is to decrease average length to stay, okay, well, what's realistic? You know, we can't just expect to have everybody leave at day 10 because some of the patients clinically don't need to leave or can't. Um, and so I think that that's where they, they may want to become more educated or may start asking questions or potentially even challenging. But, you know, it's something that they always, they've indicated to us that they're willing to do. And, and you know, they they can and have the ability to understand it. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? I, I don't remember. Yeah, it was it was based around the, you know, what is, is there any incentive to become better at these at these uh, disciplines, you know, becoming better at uh, yeah, producing think, clinical outcomes and, and better transitions of care. Yeah, the incentive for them is obviously they want to try and make their facility to be that high value provider and that high and become part of that high value network um, that the ACOs are, are pulling together. They want to be part of that because they want to make sure that they continue to secure that referral. Um, and you know, there's other things such as the star rating system. Some of that does dovetail into the star rating system. Um, but yes, they want to try and be the best that they can. They also have a competition with their, their, within their own market, within the nursing homes and any geography. So they want to be known as having the best. Um, so it is a very competitive nature that they have. So yes, there's a lot of incentives in there. And as these get tied more and more um, to reimbursement, then obviously you've got that kicker in there too. Yes. That's fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. Sean, anything you'd like to add to that question? I'd, I'd certainly echo what Michelle said. Um, you know, just to tie into the idea of the five-star ratings on the uh, medicare.gov forward slash nursing home compare, it's really interesting to look at the way Medicare stratifies that five-star rating. And um, it's also very interesting to look at a two or a three, sometimes a four-star facility can have really good outcomes in a specific disease. So the, the five-star rating, it's good, but it's also just extremely high. You know, and I think people, discharge planners and others tend to look at that and say, oh, gosh, it's a, it's a two- or a three-star facility. But really, if that ACO hospital or, or bundle payment hospital is looking to engage a high-value provider for a very specific disease, naturally, they're going to want to dig deeper than a star rating and look at the outcome specific to that disease. There are great tools, data tools out there that do this, and uh, certainly um, we can help uh, ACO hospitals and look at the different tools that are out there. But uh, it's just the idea that a, a nursing facility is much more, it, it's deeper, uh, and it's very disease specific in, in the quality that they provide uh, more than is represented by uh, the Medicare five-star rating. That's great. Thank you. Uh, maybe as a last question to address, uh, and, and perhaps we can start with you, Michelle, uh, it says this, what are some best practices that PAC providers and acute care providers can take together to enhance their relationship, relationships one with another? What are some best practices that can be undertaken? Um. Well, I've heard from, uh, again, those that have implemented and, and done um, some of the PAC strategies, what I've heard and what I've seen be successful is really think about the strategy from the get-go and what that means. And you have to get buy-in from everyone, from the top of the organization all the way down. Because if people really don't believe in having the strategy and having um, everybody work together, it's never going to work. 
So that's probably first and foremost, that it has to be an enterprise buy-in for both the post and for the ACOs. Um, otherwise, it, it, I, I just don't see how it can be successful. Um, to be more specific, things that I see have been successful is engaging post-acute as soon as possible, sometimes even within a day or two of admission to the facility, or sorry, to the acute care provider, to the hospital. Gauging them and starting to really work with them on what will be that next level um, and what's going to happen to that patient as, as, they, as they transition out. And then work with that provider, everything from transitioning their records, doctor's recommendations, notes, their medications, everything. If, if, it's a, if they need DME, HME, or oxygen, anything like that, start that as early as possible and engage those providers and hold, them, hold each other accountable. If the post-acute care provider doesn't do what they're supposed to do, call them out on it and vice versa. If this acute care facility isn't, you know, give the, the latitude to the providers and they'll call you out on it too. So I think that's key. The buy-in, engage as soon as possible and hold each other accountable. And that's where I've seen people be successful. Great, great advice. Thanks, Michelle. Sean, anything you'd like to add to Michelle's comments? <clears throat> Definitely would echo Michelle's three points. And um, specifically on that transfer of data that, that Michelle was talking about, one thing that I've seen work very effectively is when the hospital has a, a back-end user agreement, a sub-license with the nursing facility. And we've seen Epic and, and other Cerner major EMRs grant that sub-licensing ability. Uh, so that's a, a specific data sharing uh, mechanism that's worked very successfully. And then a second thought I would add is the embedding of resources from the hospital to the PAC. Uh, I worked in San Diego, for example, where we would have a Scripps Green hospitalist in our nursing facility. And, uh, you know, that doctor had a nurse practitioner that was in our facility as well. Certainly seen that with Kaiser as well. Um, and that was a model that, um, you know, that I helped bring here to Utah. So just the idea that the hospitalists will follow that patient and attend from the whole throughput of the episode, I think really creates that uh, continuity of care. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, I want to thank the ACLC membership for sending in those, those questions. We really appreciate your, your inquiry and your input. Um, I also want to thank Sean and Michelle for their insights and perspectives today. Thank you so much for pre presenting to us um, and, and thankful that, that you were able to join us. Uh, an audio recording of this conference call will be made available and will be included in our weekly news summary. The next webinar will be on September 16th on the topic of care coordination titled Optimizing Care Coordination, Exploration of Methods and Leading Practices. We'll later announce our guest speakers uh, at another time. If you have any questions on the ACLC or follow-up questions from this webinar, please email members at accountablecarelc.org, and we'll be happy to address your questions. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this presentation to be valuable. Have a nice day.